So this will be an IPLD talk about bind node, and I'll explain why that exists in a second. And I think a good place to start might be actually, because I don't want to start from um, assuming that everybody's on the same page. So we've got we've got this node interface, and this node interface is what describes any IPLD node, any IPLD value. And it has some methods like kind, what kind am I? You can interact with it, uh, look up by string to get a field. If it's, for example, an integer, you can tell it, give me the actual integer value, and so on. And you can use prototypes to build more of those. And the way most people use this interface nowadays is with CodeGen. And that's CodeGen that Eric wrote a while ago. And that is in schema gen go. So you can see quite a lot of um, code here. I'm not going to walk you through it, but you can see it's just a bunch of templating. And then a nice example of this in action is this gen demo package. Uh, full screen. So for example, um, in here. So what you start with is um, a schema. And this schema is really simple. You just have integer string a struct with some fields and then a map uh, that's pretty sim simple. And then you generate, and then what you end up with is three files. You end up with IPLD schema types. And these are types that essentially are the memory representation of your nodes. And also, for example, here's your message struct and here's your map. And notice that the map needs both an actual Go map and a slice because maps in Go do not keep the order of the keys. And then you get also get this satisfaction file, which is all the methods of that interface that I just showed you. So for example, message three, uh, look up by string. So you can see here, uh, no, that's the wrong thing. No, where is it? OK, there we go. So uh, message by string, uh, lookup by string. Because this is all code generated, it's pretty static. So it literally just generates what key am I, and then it just goes to the actual uh, field in memory. And that's fine. But if you notice, for such a tiny schema, we generated 2,000 lines of code for the uh, methods alone. And that's usually OK. That's not a, the biggest deal. But at least to me, uh, the biggest problem with this approach uh, was number one, you actually do need to code gen. So you, you add an extra step to iteration and to development. Um, and sometimes you can't code gen. For example, suppose that um, you, know, you get the schemas at runtime and you're not compiling. So code gen would be a problem then. And you also end up with these weird types with unexported fields. And interacting with those is pretty uh, finicky. So you would, you would either need to go through the methods, which are fine, but they're pretty generic, so they're not very nice, or you would have to like go into these unexported fields if you can. So that's, that was, that's the state of the art. So what I did, and I'm going to copy this here. I essentially said, OK, let, I'm going to just try to implement this with reflection. And reflection in Go, I'm going to briefly show what that is. Reflection in Go, essentially, you can do, um, if you have a value of anything, like a string or a struct or a map, you can say value of, and it gives you this reflect value, which is opaque, because it's sort of like a magic way to modify arbitrary val values of, of Go in, at runtime. And you can then, do with this, say something like, give me the Boolean value, if it's a bool. Um, can I address this to make it a pointer? Can I convert it to something else? Uh, you can also assign it things. So for example, you can say, da, 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 da. you can say set and set it to another value. Or you can say set bytes and give it directly the bytes um, in direct Go. So that's actually pretty similar to the node interface in IPLD. You can think of IPLD, the node interface in Go, as the generic way to interact with IPLD nodes. So this is the same thing, but for Go values. So what I 
what I implemented in the Binode package is essentially three APIs. One of them is prototype. And prototype, you give it your go type, uh, which is, for example, a struct definition, and you give it your schema. So here's an example of you giving both of them. So just like before, I'll make this slightly bigger. So just like before, you have to define a you have to define a schema, and, and right now that is done through this API. So you spawn some types, you accumulate them into a type system, and then you end up with types. So this is a schema type. And in this case, string of it or int is a union between a string or an int. And then I define the same types in Go. So these sort of mirror the IPLD schema types. And in this case, the way I implemented unions is just a struct containing pointers to each of the elements. And then when I call prototype, it essentially knows how to implement the node interface with those two. And then, for example, I can build a node with the IPLD um, APIs, and then I can do stuff with it. So I can encode it as DAG.JSON and stuff. So in here, you can see I can encode it as DAG.JSON at the type level. Uh, which is not very useful, or at the representation level, which is the actual union, how it's meant to be uh, when you give it to other people. And you can see, for example, has end this field here is what I said should happen in the schema. And it also knows how to, for example, infer things. So for example, if you only give it the schema, so here's the schema, but you don't give it the, the go type, it's going to build anonymous go types. So that is pretty cool, for example, if somebody is giving you schemas at runtime, but you don't have the go types, but you still want to interact with them, right? Um, that's not something you can do with CodeGen. So in this case, what it does, um, you can't really see it here, because all I do is just DAG JSON encode the data. But if I, can I edit this? I can, that's cool. So if I did something like, Ah, shit, where did it go? No. If I do something like uh, printf, tell me exactly what, um, so I've also got the unwrap API, and unwrap just gives you the underlying Go value underneath this sort of wrapping that Binode does. And if I run this, And the remote server is nice enough to do it for me. Ah, undefined font, thanks. Ah, two scroll bars. That's so useful. We'll run. Where did it go? So you should be able to see the value, but yeah, the actual types, they're not named types that you would have on statically in your Go program. They're like anonymous structs, anonymous uh, Go types. And that's pretty much it. So you have, you have these three APIs. You've got prototype, which I just showed you. You give it a Go type and you give it a schema type and it gives you a prototype. And with a prototype, you can build nodes. You can, for example, uh, decode that JSON into that. Uh, you can also unwrap to get the actual Go value underneath that. And you can also wrap. Unwrap is like prototype, but you give it an already existing Go value. So for example, here's, here's using this without a schema. So you have a Go struct, in this case, person with a bunch of fields. Uh, you fill it, and then you say wrap. But you don't give it a, a schema. So it's just going to infer what the schema is. And this is kind of um, maybe a little bit simple, but it is going to work. Uh, it's just going to, for example, for a struct, it's going to say, I'm going to guess you want an, IP, an IPLD schema struct representation map, that kind of thing. So it's just going to work. But you can also use it with a schema. So here's a schema. And I'm not sure if I did anything interesting with this schema. Oh, yes. Um, so in this case, you can see age shows up. But in here, I said age is optional. So if age is optional, if it's the zero value, then it's just going to be omitted. And because the age, I left it as a nil pointer, and I didn't specify it, then the age doesn't show up here. Mm -hmm. 
and that is pretty much it. I does anybody have any questions? Uh, if the age was zero value, it up. Yeah, so this goes into how you design this, right? Because I just made some choices here. I, I chose that optional is represent, represented by a pointer. Uh, where is that choice? So that choice is, I, I want to say documented. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, it's not documented, <laughs> but I, I, I think at the top of this, yeah, this package, I said this is experimental because it's not, so many of these choices, I made them like as simple as I thought they might be, but I, it, they're not set in stone. Um, once I, there's some things that are still yet to be implemented, uh, like some advanced features. Once I finish all of that, I'm probably gonna fix the behavior and then I'm gonna properly document it. Um, but if I go into, Ah, that's a different tab, isn't it? Yes, it is. So here's, for example, the code that says from a schema type, infer the go type. And I think the opposite, yeah, there it is. So for example, type struct. So I look at the, at the struct fields in the IPLD schema, and I say, is it nullable? Uh, I just add a level of interaction with a pointer. If it's optional, I do that again. If both are used at the same time, don't ask me what happens. I haven't tested it. <laughs> but you're going to end up with two pointer levels. Um, and you can also see, for example, here, when I find a map, I just wrap it in a struct with keys and values. I think a lot of this will get easier with generics because, for example, optional types, I'm going to be able to say an optional of T with a Boolean and not have to jump around memory with pointers. And also because pointers in Go are kind of like if you want to make a pointer to the number three, you have to declare a variable of value three and then take a pointer to that, which is kind of annoying. What was your question? My, my question is. Um... In terms of determinism, and how much have you taken into account about interacting with other languages? For example, can we guarantee that the reflection will be deterministic in different machines? Like that there will be no situation where one interprets something as a slice and another uh, another interprets it as a string, and then when they manipulate the data, what they serialize back is actually something that is different. Um, so in case the mic isn't biking, picking it up, the question is, uh, it, can you guarantee that reflection works the same on every single machine, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the answer is yes, because they follow the Go spec and memory model. So it's the same in theory if reflect has no bugs. Yeah. It's the same as asking, can you guarantee that a Go program behaves the same on all machines, right? Yeah. Well, what I'm concerned is like when you, and, and I know this just for my interface between Go and JS a lot of times. Mm -hmm is that there is different interpretations of like what are slices and what are strings and, uh, and so on. And mm -hmm. often that would lead to situations where you would create the same data or you would start from the same starting point and then apply the same transformation supposedly. And when you serialize it back, you actually have something with a different CID just because the, the way that the one girl would write it in one way and JS would write it in another way. Uh, and so my question is, like, can we securely or provably go back and forth between multiple runtimes uh, and ensure that um, this will not create an event where the data will be modified in a way that is not deterministic, therefore generating different settings in different machines? I'm going to summarize the question for the mic in case. Um, yeah. It's essentially, can you guarantee that the data is going to be the same across different runtimes and languages? Yeah. Because, for example, strings in JavaScript are UTF-16, and in Go, they're UTF-8, and other languages don't allow nulls and strings, that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. I think the answer there is more pointing towards the IPLD data model spec, because it tries to marry a lot of those things. Um, so there was a pretty large discussion about what is a valid IPLD data model string, for example, because exactly of those reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, beyond that, 
I think the behavior of bind nodes should be practically the same as the code gen. So if, if, if this has a problem, I think code gen would have it as well. So I don't yeah. think it's making anything worse. As far as proving perfection, I haven't thought about it too hard. Gotcha. And the idea of the data model, like, I think it has its own challenges regarding cross language stuff, like integers are like, I've looked at it, it's like, well, generally integers are in 60, or it's 64, but, 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 but not, to, but only up to a certain number because JavaScript doesn't really use 64. So mm -hmm. like, I feel like some of that stuff over time is going to be a long process to clean out. But I would, I, I would tend to agree that it's not generating from Go code is probably no different than code generating from this one last one because you're still generating code. Go code. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, can I ask a question? Has sure. there been one thing that one use case that I really continually wanted was like I want code gen because I want it to be fast and no right. reflection and all that. But on the other hand, I want to code gen from a Go struct because that's what I've already got used. <laughs> and I don't want to like like I've got a Go struct that I've been using, let's say, and writing serialization code with like C more gen, essentially. Um, uh, and I want to use switch it over to using IPLP Prime for the like actual moment when you write it. Um, is there like a version of this that does the code gen as opposed to just doing it at runtime? Um, so there's multiple options you could take here. Um, you could do code gen like that. Yeah. My argument would probably be that you would sort of. Uh, you would have advantages and disadvantages yeah. because, for example, if you need code gen, then you sort of lose some of the advantages of not needing code gen, sure, right? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is a different use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of performance, um, I actually haven't measured this, but I think I'm, I'm willing to bet that bind node is within the same order of magnitude as um, as code gen in terms of performance. It might be maybe like 50% slower, maybe up to twice as slow, I haven't measured it. But there's this has not been optimized. There's quite a lot of things you could do. Um, and I want to show you one example, if I can find it. Uh, because encoding JSON works in a pretty similar way. It uses, um, da, 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 da. It uses reflection, right? And yeah. this is the wrong tab. Yeah. And the way it accomplishes that, so yeah, you do pay um, a reflection penalty because anytime you give it a value and it has to encode it, it has yeah. to like look at the value with reflection, right? Yeah. But there's stuff that it can do upfront and cache. And right. let me see if I can find the code. Uh, da, 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 da. Maybe I'm gonna... Hmm, where was this? Yeah, I, th I think I think this is it. So, yeah. struct oh, nice. fields, yeah. list of fields. Yeah. So here, for example, uh, it it remembers how to encode the name of a of a, of a field of a struct field name yeah. of a struct field. It also remembers the encoder func. Mm. So it 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 sort of builds a a function at yeah. Runtime to encode a value and yeah. then memoizes that later. Yeah. So type encoder. Ba, 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 ba. It would be interesting to see New type like, if it indeed is. Yeah. So here, for example, it it, it tries to new struct encoder is probably a good example. Uh -huh. What are what are the next steps that that happen here that connect this to? Yeah, before I go to that, just to finish the answer to Hannah, we, I probably do want to do things like that for Binode, and they probably will help, help significantly. Yeah. So then you only pay for the cost of accessing the values that you need right. to interact with, right. but looking at the types will be essentially cached. And I mean, and I think a, like a prerequisite would be like benchmarking. Yeah, code yeah definitely. Binode and shooting for like, oh, if you could get it within 50%, they're like, that would be like, there'd be very few cases where you want to code 
Yes, and I also think Cogen has quite a lot of pointers and overhead of its own. Yeah. So uh, it's probably still going to be less, but it's still going to be some overhead. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the benchmarks look like. One, one other thing that I'm curious about is, it's one thing that's never been addressed in Cogen is custom or serialization methods. And yes. I wonder if you can hook this up to like, since we already are running Seymour Gen all over the code, we could potentially hook this up to like, totally like thinking we could hook this up so that like the wrapped type could look for the Seymour Gen methods and if so like generate the IP of the crime like yes, fast could. path methods from that. Yes, yeah. Could. Yeah, which would be super interesting because you could like throw IP of the crime all over the path. Um, I, I can't remember who it was. It might have been you who suggested to replace that it's it would be possible to replace the Cyborgen use cases with this. Yeah. Because Cyborgen works in a very similar way. Uh, oh, it, it it looks at stuff with reflection. reflection. Yeah. 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 So it's, it generates code because it's trying to do super fast. You know. I don't know. Who knows. That is like, like my understanding is that's a huge yeah. performance. Like yeah, at, at the same time, the people I believe that the people who benchmark that never tried reflection. Yeah. So I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm willing to give it a try. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe interesting. The question from Will was next steps in terms of connecting this, right? Um, so something that I'm working on right now with Eric and should be ready in a few days, because Eric did unblock me on this is to essentially use Bindnode to implement the schema schema. And the schema schema is very briefly, we've got this schema spec, but it's itself defined as an IPLD node, and it, so it has a schema. Um, and then you can use that to, for example, parse a plain text schema in its language, and then take the DAG JSON and do stuff with it. So that used to be used with CodeGen, but that was a problem because you would run into this dependency cycle where you needed the schema to be able to run code gen so that you would implement the schema, but with bind node, you don't have that cycle. And I think that's pretty much it for me.